There's nothing better than what the Bible calls being saved by God. And in the scriptures, we are unmistakably and absolutely saved by grace and through faith. Since that's the case, what do we do with all these biblical references to water baptism? Well, stay with me for the next few moments and let's explore what the Bible has to say about the gift of baptism. So the Protestant Reformation occurred largely in Central Europe, in uh, Central and in Western Europe, places like Germany and Switzerland and to some extent France as well. We often think of the Protestant Reformation as beginning with Martin Luther and that's accurate, but it wasn't very long after Luther that we had John Calvin who was down in the French speaking parts of Switzerland and then in the German speaking part of Switzerland was uh, uh, Ulrich Zwingli. And Zwingli started a really radical reformation in uh, Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, by 1522, 1523, the entire city of Zurich was becoming reformed. Now, it's a little odd to me that one of the things that Zwingli was trying to do was to make a break with the Roman Catholic Church. And his argument was, we're just gonna go back to the scripture. But when Zwingli did this, he unleashed a reformation that quickly got out of his control. And he discovered that there were some people who wanted to go more back to the scriptures even than he did. And they were called the Anabaptists. Anabaptist is from a Greek term that means rebaptized. And what these people were arguing is that if you really want to be right with God, you should be baptized not as a baby when you have no say in it, not as a baby when you can't even have faith, not as a baby when nobody dares immerse you all in water, but all they can do is sprinkle you, not as a baby when you're not capable of repenting, but the Anabaptist argued, you need to be baptized when you are old enough to have faith and when you're old enough to repent of your sins. And because virtually everyone in Europe had already been baptized as a baby, the Anabaptists were saying, you need now to be rebaptized as an adult Rebaptized in Greek is Anabaptist. So they got the name Anabaptist. By the way, Baptist churches today, Southern Baptist, American Baptist, National Baptist, so forth, Baptists today get their name from the Anabaptists. They are the descendants of the Anabaptists. Well, Zwingli and the city council of Zurich thought they had gone too far. And so they actually passed a city ordinance, if you can imagine this, forbidding rebaptism of anyone as they were an adult. So if you were baptized as a baby, you could not be baptized again as adult on pains of breaking the law. And if you were caught baptizing somebody as an adult, you got the death penalty in Zurich. That's how serious they were about it. Well, uh, sometime back I had the opportunity, the privilege of going to Zurich and visiting uh, many of the Reformation sites there. It's a fascinating city with a lot of fascinating Reformation sites. The one that I had to really search out, but eventually found, that was is still to me one of the most moving of uh, all Reformation sites in Europe, was the actual site of the execution of a man by the name of Felix Manns, M-A-N-Z. Felix Manns was an Anabaptist. He was a rebaptizer. And he just said, the scriptures teach us to do baptism as adults. And so I want to baptize as adults. Well, he was caught doing this. And so in the year 1527, the city council condemned him to death. They took him down to the river Lamont, which empties right there into Lake Zurich. As you can almost not tell any difference between the river and the lake itself. They tied his hands behind his back and tied him to his knees and ran a pole up where the, ro where the uh, rope was. And they lowered him down in the river and in a sense of irony, mocking him, these Protestant Christians drowned him. As he was going down to the river, he was preaching the scriptures. His own mother and his own brother were following him. And you know what they were saying to him? Don't back down. Don't back down. Die for your convictions. How about that for a mother? Die for your convictions. When he got there, his last words are reported to have been, into your hands, O God, 
I happily commit my soul. So here's my question. Why has baptism been such a controversial issue? Why is it that when you talk about baptism, people get all up in arms? Why is it that so many denominations and fellowships can't seem to come to an agreement on what baptism is about? And some fellowships just almost don't talk about it at all. Why is it that some fellowships will baptize little babies and they'll do it by sprinkling or putting a little water on their heads? Other fellowships would not dare baptize a baby, would only baptize an older teen or an adult. Some fellowships are okay with dipping somebody in water, but they're okay also with just washing the head off. Other fellowships are adamant. No, it absolutely must be an immersion all the way in the water. What is it about baptism that provokes so much controversy, even to the point that there were not just a few, but actually many hundreds of Anabaptists and Baptists who were martyred in Europe simply because they believed in adult baptism. What is it about baptism? Well, I want to talk about baptism some in this lesson and also in the next. And what I want to do in this lesson uh, is I want to just point out in some ways how the Christian faith has really used baptism as this wonderful gift from God. And that's really what we want to think of. Baptism as a wonderful gift from God that symbolizes our transformation from the world of darkness into the kingdom of light. That baptism symbolizes for us a spiritual death, dying to the old selfish person, full of sin, full of guilt, full of remorse, and being born again into a new life, a, a new creation, a new relationship with Christ. I want to point out how many denominations, Baptist churches, Methodist churches, Presbyterian churches, Roman Catholic churches, Lutheran churches, my own fellowship, Churches of Christ, how all of us believe in baptism. All of us have a doctrine of baptism that sees it as this great symbol, this great story, this great metaphor of how we can have our sins washed away and how we can look like Jesus Christ. And so let's start by just making a couple of observations about water, water. I'll start with the uh, psychoanalyst Carl Jung, who once made the remark about water that water is one of the deepest archetypes of the human mind. Now, here's what he means. He means that had you never read a poem about water or never had a, a religion that focused on water, had you never heard a song about water, had you never even seen a body of water, a large body of water, you would still somewhere deep in your DNA, you would still have some sense that water is a purification technique for us, that it's a way that we get our spirits or our bodies or we get our emotions or our intellect purified. And that's why in virtually every world religion, not just the Christian religions, but in virtually every world religion, water plays some kind of role. I mean, you think about the Ganges River, plays a very important role for the Hindu faith because they too have this archetypal understanding that water symbolizes for all humans some sort of cleansing or some sort of washing. So when we get to Judaism, the religion of the Jews, we actually learn that the Jews practiced baptisms almost every single day. I think it comes as a shock to a lot of Christians to know that the Jews not only will baptize, but today in an Orthodox Jewish synagogue, and in some conservatives, the most conservative is Orthodox, but then there's also conservative who are not quite as uh, conservative as Orthodox. Typically in an Orthodox synagogue today, the first thing they build before they even finish their building is a baptistry. They say, we put the baptistry here, now we'll build the synagogue around it. In fact, in an Orthodox synagogue, you have to sell your Torah, these expensive scrolls, these parchment scrolls of the Torah, of the first five books of the Bible. You're supposed to sell the Torah and get the money to build a baptistry if you don't yet have one. The baptistry is more important than the Torah in an Orthodox Jewish synagogue. So why is it that water is so important to the Jews? Well, the Old Testament is actually filled with references 
to baptisms. Now, occasionally the Greek word baptizo is used in the Old Testament, but typically it's a collection of other words that just mean to wash something, to dip it, to shake it around in water, to plunge it, or some uh, a cognitive term that's associated with this. Let me give you just a few examples of how baptism figures in the Jewish faith in the Old Testament. I think these will be helpful. By the way, I should have started with this text. I want to start with the text. So I'm going to start with Hebrews chapter 6, and I want you to hear what the Hebrew writer has to say about baptism. It's a really important text. But let me just pause and ask you a question before we actually look at this text. If I were to ask you to write down, let's just say, the six most important doctrines of the Christian faith, I want you to write down the six most important doctrines of the Christian faith. What would you write down? Actually, I've had people ask me, will you preach on the fundamentals of the faith? And it's always kind of odd to me that almost every time in my church, in the churches of Christ, every time they ask you to preach on the fundamentals of the faith, they almost always put music in there, which by the way, is not a fundamental to the faith, just in case you hadn't noticed. It's just not one of the fundamentals. If you want to know what the six fundamentals of the faith are, the Bible actually numbers them for you in Hebrews chapter six, verses one and two. Let me read it to you. Here's what the Hebrew writer says. He says, let's go on and leave the elementary fundamental ABC teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. And then he names what these fundamental doctrines are. Repentance from acts that lead to death. Repentance is a fundamental doctrine. Faith in God, a fundamental doctrine. Instruction about baptisms, a fundamental doctrine. Baptism is a fundamental doctrine of the faith, he says. Laying on of hands, which is the appointment of officers and the healing of the sick. Resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Those are the six fundamentals of the Christian faith, according to the Hebrew writer. And I just want you to see in there that when we talk about baptism, we're doing a good thing. Because not only is it a great gift for God, a great gift from God. Not only is it a great doctrine in all the denominations I know of, Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists, Catholics, Lutherans, you name them, Adventists, Mormons, whatever. All of us have this appreciation for what baptism is. Not only that, but baptism is just one of the foundations of Christian teaching. I, I needed to share that. Now let's go back to our Old Testament texts. So how do they use water? in a religious way when they were Jews in the Old Testament world. Let me give you a few scriptures. Exodus chapter 19, verses 13 and 14, Moses is at Mount Sinai. He's coming down from Sinai and God instructs him to have all the people wash themselves off. Now, why would you even wash yourself? By the way, I've been to Mount Sinai and let me tell you, there is no water to be seen anywhere at Mount Sinai. I mean, it's just as dry as a bone out there. It is a, a, a desert mountain. There's just one or two little springs. And to use that water to wash yourself off must mean that there's something really important about that spiritual washing. I want you to see that even at the giving of the law, when the law was given at Mount Sinai, they were baptizing themselves. The baptism was a statement of purifying yourself before the law of God. Here's some other texts. Exodus 29 and verse four. When Moses was ordaining the high priest Aaron and his two sons, God said, I want you to baptize them, to wash them off. And that washing is a symbolic statement of their purification. So the washing of water baptism is a symbol of your being cleansed, made pure in the presence of God. Exodus chapter 30. You know this if you've studied the tabernacle and later the temple in Judaism. God instructs Moses and the people of Israel to construct a huge bronze wash tub. We call it the bronze basin or the wash basin or their, their Latin and French terms that we sometimes use. But essentially it's just a big bathtub made out of bronze. It's set on a bronze stand. And the purpose of this big wash tub was, the Bible says, every time the priests come in, they're to baptize their hands and baptize their feet. And every time they make a sacrifice, they're to baptize a part of that sacrifice in this water. Why? Is it because it's dirty? No, not really. It's not a matter of getting dirt off your hands. It's a symbolic metaphorical statement that says, I'm doing this so that I can be pure in the presence of God. You see how baptism is functioning already in the Old Testament? We haven't even gotten to John the Baptist or to Jesus. 
Here we are in Leviticus chapter one, and I have to kind of move fast now. If you're making a sacrifice, verse 13, you must baptize sections of the meat that you're sacrificing. Leviticus chapter 13, if you have a skin disorder, eczema or psoriasis, or even worse, if you were to have Hansen's disease or classic leprosy, you have to baptize yourself before you can be considered pure before God. This is one reason why in Israel, there are so many baptistries from antiquity that still survive. You know, around the temple itself, around the temple proper, there are no fewer than 150 baptistries. And these are very big baptistries, not little ones like in our churches. They run 10 and 15 feet deep and there's no river there to get the water. They have to bring the water in or channel the water from rainfall. They're really serious about this because they understand if you're going to approach God, the Jews believed, you've got to be baptized. Let's keep reading. Leviticus chapter 13, Leviticus 13 and verse 58. If you had clothing that got mildew on it, leather or woven fabric of any kind, and it got mildew on it, you know what you had to do to it? You had to baptize it. Why? Does the water get the mildew off? Those of you who wash clothes, water doesn't get mildew off. It's not a matter of cleaning the mildew off. It's a matter of making a purification statement, which is to say, I know there's something impure before God. The water is a symbol of my making it pure back before God. We go to Deuteronomy 23. In Deuteronomy 23, we're told that if you had some kind of a bodily emission of fluid, uh, all kinds of ways to think about that, both for men and for women, if you have an emission of fluid from your body, you have to be baptized. You're supposed to be baptized before you go to the temple. You need to be baptized. Why? Because you have to wash it off? No, not because you're washing it off. Because the water itself becomes a symbol of your interest in being pure before God. So do you see how water is being used as a great symbol? All through the Hebrew Scriptures, all through the Old Testament, this is true. In fact, it is so true in Scripture that the scriptures themselves, the Old Testament, uses this idea of baptism as a metaphor for being forgiven of your sins. Listen to these scriptures. Elijah, 2 Kings chapter 5. Elisha meets a commander of the Syrian army who has leprosy. His name is Naaman. And Naaman is sent to talk to Elisha about how to get rid of leprosy. Elisha works miracles. And Elisha says, go down to the river Jordan and dip seven times, plunge yourselves seven times. And on the seventh time, you'll be clean. By the way, I just pause and ask the question, what do you think would have happened to Naaman if he'd have said, you know, I, that doesn't make sense to me. I'm not going to do it. Actually, he did say that at first. He said, I got some rivers back up in Syria that are a lot better than the, than the Jordan. The Jordan's not much to look at. And so he hesitates and someone speaks some wisdom to him and says, you know, you really need to do what the prophet has said. He goes down. Imagine this. Naaman dips himself the first time and comes up and looks at his skin. And what do you think he sees? Still leprosy. What do you think he saw after the fifth time? Still leprosy. What do you think he saw after the sixth time? Still leprosy. It wasn't until he had fully obeyed and had that washing that he comes up and his skin is like the skin of a baby. Here's how David puts it. Psalm 51. David has been convicted of his sin. He's committed murder and adultery. And he writes this repentant Psalm, Psalm 51. And he says to the Lord, wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Then in verse seven, cleanse me with hyssop. That's like a, like a, kind of like a broom plant. Cleanse me with hyssop. I will be clean. Wash me so I can be whiter than snow. He's not talking about a literal washing. He understands that it's his sin that needs to be purified. But he uses water as an image or a symbol or a metaphor to talk about a spiritual cleansing that he knows that he needs. Here's how Isaiah puts it. Isaiah chapter 1, when Isaiah is speaking to the children of Israel who are full of sin, and Isaiah says, your hands are full of blood. And then what do you think he tells them to do? Wash yourselves or baptize yourselves and make yourselves clean. Now, if they had gone down to the Jordan River 
and dip themselves in the river and come up? Do you think that would have made them pure before God? He's really speaking symbolically here. What he's saying is water is a great symbol for an inward cleansing that, uh, uh, that God offers to us. And with all of that background, it's probably no wonder that the New Testament opens the opening chapters with a guy named John the Baptist coming down, baptizing people for repentance in the Jordan River. That is, the New Testament opens with baptisms, with washing, because they had a thousand-year tradition of baptism by the time John the Baptist came. People already understood this symbol. They were already practicing the symbol of baptism. In fact, as I've already said, they were, there were these um, baptistries that the Jews built. One, one way, if you, uh, if you ever get the opportunity to do archaeology in Israel, uh, I've had some opportunity to do a little bit of this. When you're excavating a site, one way that you will know it's an Israelite site, a Jewish site, is a Jewish site will always have a baptistry. Canaanite sites don't. So there may be a Canaanite ruin, a Canaanite tell right here, and just a hundred yards over here is another tell, and it's Jewish and you'll always know the difference because the Jewish tale will have a baptistry in it. Every time you went to the temple, you actually went fully down into a baptistry. It's called a mikvah in Hebrew. You go all the way down in it until the water's over your head and then you come all the way back up. In fact, the mikvot, that's plural for mikvah, the mikvot actually have a dividing line and you can imagine that people would line up on the right-hand side to go in the water. You come out on the left-hand side and you don't touch anybody because if you touch them, you make them unclean. They got to go back to the back of the line and go through it all again. Jews were doing this every day of their lives they were baptizing. It was just ordinary stuff for Jews to baptize, not because they needed a bath, but because they understood this great symbol of washing as making me pure and ready for the presence of God. So it's a great symbol that the New Testament actually picks up on. So what is it that the churches teach and what do they do at baptism? Well, let me just share with you a couple of things that some of the great thinkers of various churches have actually said about baptism. I want to start with just a few of these. Let me start with this one. Many churches recite what's called the Apostles' Creed in their services. I think if you're a Methodist, you're probably reciting the Apostles' Creed. Uh, many other uh, fellowships also use the Apostles' Creed. Most likely, the Apostles' Creed was actually written, here's a surprise, as a baptismal formula. So if you want to know what it says, go online and Google Apostles' Creed. It's, it's a very, very short little statement. And it was just the kind of thing that you taught all what's called catechumens. So anybody who's interested in becoming a Christian, by the third and fourth century, you had to spend a year getting ready for it in repentance. And part of that was learning the Apostles' Creed so that you could confess the Orthodox faith. And then at your baptism, you actually said the Apostles' Creed. And this was one way to assure that you knew what you were doing when you were being baptized. The Apostles' Creed is a baptismal creed. Not many years after the Apostles' Creed became a very standard creed, there was written what's called the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed is probably the most important universal church creed ever written. The Nicene Creed is a standardized creed. It was written a couple of different times. By the end of the fourth century, it was finally finalized. It was formalized. And again, many churches recite the Nicene Creed. I want you to know I believe every word of the Nicene Creed. I believe it because it's right and because it matches the Bible. I don't care who said it. I just think it matches the scriptures. But have you noticed that the Nicene Creed says... Right towards the end, it's, we acknowledge that Jesus Christ is going to return and the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. And just before that, the Nicene Creed actually says, we acknowledge that there is one baptism for the remission of sins. That's the most universal creed in the entire world of Christianity saying we acknowledge. If you say the Nicene Creed, you're acknowledging one baptism for the remission of sins. It's in the Nicene Creed. The, again, perhaps the most important creed ever written in Christian history. Roman Catholicism routinely teaches, of course, baptism. Uh, Roman Catholicism will baptize adults, teens, or babies. And the idea of infant baptism for Roman Catholics is that you're being baptized on the basis of your parents' faith. And then when you get old enough to understand it, you have to have that confirmed. Hence the confirmation in a Catholic church. 
But what Roman Catholics are doing with baptism is they're simply making a statement that this act of baptism makes us pure before God and puts us in a covenant relationship with God. Let me read to you one line from uh, a Catholic cate uh, catechesis, a Catholic uh, book for, for newcomers. I quote, Baptism is the door of the church and the entrance into a new life. We're born from the state of slaves of sin into the freedom of the sons of God. Baptism incorporates us with Christ's mystical body and makes us partakers of all the privileges flowing from the redemptive act of the church's divine founder. Martin Luther, founder of the Lutheran Church, had a very high view of baptism and says that baptism is the gift, I'm quoting, the gift God gives us for the forgiveness of our sins. It's a seal, the sacrament of our body. And through baptism, we never need doubt our salvation. This is one of the great gifts of baptism is that it's a way of assuring our salvation, an outward sign of the grace God gives us inwardly. Well, we could keep going. But I'm going to stop here and I'm going to encourage you to come back to the next lesson because I want us to continue to unpack what the ch great churches have said about baptism. And then I want us to look at what the New Testament says about it as well. And here's why. We are saved. We should say this over and over. We are saved by grace through faith and not by any work. Never, never say you're saved by works. You're not. It's impossible. You're only saved by the grace of God through faith. And yet baptism is such a great gift that we want to understand why the scriptures teach it. So come back next time. Lord, I pray you give us a heart to believe so that we receive the grace of God and seal it in the act of baptism. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So I think it's surprising to a lot of people to realize that God has always used baptism as a symbol of purification in His presence in the Hebrew Scriptures as well as in the New Testament. I want you to join us again next time as we continue to explore water baptism. Mm -hmm.